Hello, welcome back to Chat About It, Don't Chat About It with me, Rachel, aka the Queen of the Woke, as crowned by one of my haters. Now, this weekend's video is actually going to be the only video and podcast that I actually released this weekend because it has taken a long time for me to put this together. It's a bit niche and it's all to do with my acting industry, my industry that I have worked in for well, since I was a teenager. And if you're not interested, that's fine. You can click away. Don't forget forget to give it a share though this may help other people to learn from something and educate themselves on how to go about finding their way in the industry now I don't want to undermine any of the people that are involved in this everything that has come forward whether or not you think it's vile and disgusting at this current stage it is of course just allegations and I also don't want to sound like I'm defending um the agent involved at the same time so and I also um, totally sympathize and I say sympathize because I've had what everyone has has claimed I've had it happen to me as well not through this particular agency but another one now I am taking of course a very huge risk in in calling this out but I'm not afraid to do that because to be honest with you I share extremely opinionated views on my chat about it don't chat about it with Rachel channel and if that doesn't put me out of a job then I don't know what will to be quite frank with you so the scandal that happened involved a a talent agency called Bodhi Talent Agency now we will get to those articles but I I was uh, shocked to find out about it. In actual fact, I actually found out about it quite late in into the uh, into the thing. I was on my hidden Twitter account, and it came up on my hidden Twitter account from uh, the ninety eight percent podcast people. I think that's what they're called. Sorry, sorry. I will get to them at the end. Um, I might have got that name entirely wrong, but I'm I'm sorry. Um, and. I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh, not again. And, you know, say that sort of like not again thing It's because obviously I have had that experience myself. So I, I was really surprised. Now, this is the most recent one that I've heard of. And it's made extremely big news, like probably bigger than anything that I've seen in a in especially in a long time and so what I did was I had a look at their website and if I come to it here I typed in on Google Bodhi uh, talent agency and this is what I got their website is now under construction but as you can see here at the top it says bodhitalent.co.uk and I also had a look at the company's house. Now, I'm not going to pull up the company's house here on the screen, but there is an active proposal to strike off, which is the same for my agency that did the same thing to me. And this is going back quite a while ago now. So that's that's very, very intriguing. Very intriguing. So, so agencies really have a specific way of working. When you sign with an agent, you you go in, you audition for them, or you just straight up meet them. Sometimes you become recommended of another agent and you just swap over to that agency and that's fine. You go in, you read through your terms and your conditions, you read through your contract, and then you sign up, they make changes to your spotlight profile, they add you to the spotlight profile, they give you something called tagmin, most of them give you something called tagmin actually I should say, and that's a, uh, a like a connected casting platform to the spotlight CV, and you don't pay to sign up, you don't pay, Don't. and if any agent ever contacts you and says, you know, would you like to pay and register with me, as an agent and I will get you acting work don't do it don't ever do it it is not common practice for agents to do that there is no law against it but at the same time there's no it's not common practice now so you sign your contract and all of that and then um you get uh you get a 
very um, restricted list of breakdowns from uh, from the Spotlight profile. I can't legally show you any of those breakdowns, I'm afraid, because those are private and confidential. But what you do then is yeah, you submit that anything that you want to be sent for, and then your agent also is working on anything else that you don't get to see the agent might get to see and they'll submit you and then when you have an audition they will contact you and it goes in through your tagmin you take your audition you either send in something called a self-tape or you attend an in-person audition uh and it's common practice nowadays to do the self-tape first and then do a recall and most recalls pay out 50 pounds per recall and then once you know once you book the job and all of that, the agency will have listed in the in the in the terms and conditions in the contract how much of a percentage, and it usually varies depending on what you are actually doing. So things like commercials generally and TV work will generally take a higher percentage versus what you actually get uh, with with theatre or just like a one time. Uh, day project or something like that. You know, they all vary in percentages. Now, percentages can be quite high and and that's just the way it works but that's how you pay your agent you never pay to sign up now and uh, communication is also very key I must be clear on that communication you have to be able to talk backwards and forwards with your agent now that doesn't mean pestering your agent all the time it just means that if you have a question go to your agent and your agent would do their best to answer you and backwards and forwards. I generally, for the most part, leave my agents alone unless there is something specific that I need looking at, essentially. Now, let's head on over to Equity. Now, I'm not logged into my Equity account, but if you are unsure about um, agents, Equity have this information. So equity is the actors union here in the UK and they give you advice about what to check for when signing with the, with an agent. Now, here's the thing. Quite a lot of people say, do your due diligence, do your due diligence. And no matter how many times you hear, do your due diligence, you can say, I did do my due diligence, excuse me, and and you can still get scammed. You can still get still get duped. I did my due diligence. I can't say that word, but I did it with um, my not my previous agent, but the one that I had issues with before that, and it got me into this horrible mess where between myself and my main agent, and I will talk about it later. Anyway, I ended up um, contacting uh, this man named Martin Kenny, who is actually listed on here in uh, the contact us section right here. Now, they have some useful information on agents. And um, have you done a background check on this agency is probably one of the most important ones that you really do need to look at. Now, I'm going to highlight something here whilst highlighting what's on the screen is that the issue that we have as new graduates is that I don't, I don't know if this is still the case because I graduated in 2009 now that I think about it, but it may still very well be the case. Universities and drama schools don't teach you the important ins and outs of how to use things like the equity website and utilize it to your advantage. They also don't tell you what lists that you need to look for when you are looking for the for an agent. Now, quite often, uh, universities and uh, drama schools hold an agency showcase where they invite agents over to come and watch them perform. And quite a lot of them get lucky and they get signed with an agent, you know, just like that. That's great, and that's a good way to do it, but you still haven't learned the important tools that really do need to be taught by our educators. Most of what I've learned since leaving my university is stuff that I've really needed, things like tax, how to find an agent, um, and my legal support. Where do I go? What do I do if something goes wrong? How to understand a contract. They teach you all this budgeting stuff, 
but they don't teach you how to read contracts and everything like that. How to audition is also an important one. They don't teach you that, or they never used to. They used to say when you audition for the show that you are actually um, auditioning for for your your exam that's your audition experience but the thing is you could only be doing two shows a year so how is that your audition experience so they really need to focus on it anyway back to equity website so the um agent uh so the equity website has given you and i'll show you these lists in a, in a minute they've given you uh, a few lists now one of them i actually couldn't find which was the national agent uh, entertainment agents council and i think it's actually been merged with agents association because they came up with the same website however do not quote me on that i may very well be wrong it might just be that the, this has not been updated recently um And then uh, it talks about verbal agency agreements. Now, an agency agreement, I'll just read it quickly, uh, maybe verbal or in writing. It has nothing. Uh, so if nothing is written down, there is still a contract. Insist on a written agency agreement. The agency is obliged by law to set up its main terms in writing and failure to do so can lead to disputes later on about what was actually agreed. And this is so important. I you know i will not do a verbal agreement with an agency ever it doesn't matter whether the agency is on one of these lists or not so then um it talks about uh the uh agency agreement and your uh like what happens here? So some agency agreements may impose long notice periods on performers requiring them to give notice of up to 12 months before they can leave the agency. You may have only a short period during each year where you can give notice before uh, being committed. And I f that that uh, that is a very long time, but you know, um, alternatively, a performer may be bound to the agency for several years before notice can be given. Do you want to be with the same agent for a long time? And these are such important things to know, particularly when you have to do your due diligence and try and work out what are the good agencies versus the not. Now, leaving the agency, you can leave an agency before the agreed term has expired you cannot be forced to stay with the agency if you don't want to, whatever the agency may claim. However, you may have to pay compensation to the agency if you left before the agreed term has expired, which is quite, um, which is why I quite like um, the, uh, the P, uh, here it's Personal Managers Association, um, PMA, what they, uh, go with because was it them yeah i think it is them i think they um when you want to sever ties it's common practice for the agent who is under who is under that particular group to actually offer you eight weeks and those eight weeks are optional with some agencies i don't know about other agencies i really don't but um yeah and then, uh, and this is uh, also very important, open-ended claims for commission. Some agents claim commission on renewals of engagements a performer secures after the performer has left the agency. The rationale for this is that the agent who secured the first engagement is entitled to commission on all income the performer ever receives because the agent got the original engagement for the performer. Such claims rarely have legal justification. Do not agree to pay commission on this basis before getting advice. So I, I will, of course, link this equity page so that you can um, peruse it for, at, your own, at your own leisure. But let's talk quickly about the lists that have been linked. So if you click on it, so I'm in, I'm in the Find an Agent section on the Entertainment Agents Association Limited, LTD. And here, as you can see, you can search by name. You can look for an agent on here if you want to. But if you go down, you can see these agents are all on here. 
Now, whatever loop, I, I don't know what loopholes they have, uh, not loopholes, so excuse me, what um, they have to go through in order to get onto any of these because I'm not an agent, but they are here. And then if we go to PMA, this is their list. It's on the main page. It's right at the bottom. But this is their list as of uh, February 2024. Now, my last agent that I was with for four and a half years, fantastic agent, is on this list. They are a member of the PMA, and I would highly recommend that agency. You'll find out later if you pay attention to something that I'm going to show you who they are. Um, and then the Cooperative Personal Management Association, they have theirs listed on here, and it's got various ones like Midlands. And if you're going by, like, um, you know, area, then this is a good website also to look at. Now, of course, most agents are, of course, based in uh, in in London, but you know, we do have them dotted around certain areas of the country too. Now, Spotlight. So I was talking about um, criteria that an agent might actually have to meet um, in order to join those associations that they are members of. Now, I don't obviously, I don't know what they are, but actors, performers, we all have to gain something, work towards something. Now, this is the membership criteria. Obviously, I'm not logged in on Spotlight, just to be clear, because I don't want to accidentally show you confidential information. Um, but this is on the main page of uh, the Spotlight CV, and it tells you exactly what members used to uh, have to get now this used to be so so much more complicated um to get onto it has since been updated it is a little bit simpler much simpler i don't know but the uh for, so for example uh, option one uh in order to join spotlight experience you have to have at least one featured role with an equity or equivalent union contract or two professional performance credits or have completed at least a year of full-time professional tr performance training equivalent to an RQF level five or two years of part-time training. Now, I got in based on my training. And then, uh, so I would have got in on number two, you have completed at least a year of full-time professional performance training equivalent to an RQF level five or two years part-time training. I have a, um, a BA, Bachelor of Arts in Musical Theatre, so I got in on number two. Now, number three, this is, I, this is the first time in a while that I've actually looked at this page on Spotlight, so I think this is new. I don't remember it being here. I could be wrong, I could be wrong. But it says, recommendations or Spotlight have been recommended by a Spotlight registered agent, by a Spotlight registered agent, or a party that's a member of the one of the following professional organizations, Casting Directors Guild, Casting Society of America, Casting Directors Association. Okay, so those are the things that actors have to do. Now, let's have a look. So... Spotlight also have a list of agents, and there are 1,404 results found in agents. That is a lot. Considering when you look at the lists, I mean, is this the same amount? I don't know. It's, it's hard to say, but there are... There are 1,404 results found in agents. And I actually then was like, when I saw that amount, I have used this page to apply for agents. And in, a, in actual fact, this, this is where I found, now I'm not saying 
remember, this is not, I'm not blaming Spotlight for this. This is nothing to do with Spotlight. This is to do with the sham agent that I had. And I'm not naming their name. Um, this is where I found them originally. And I found there was a website, and I can't remember what it's called. It doesn't exist anymore, that I also found them on. And I contacted them through that particular website but I originally saw their listing on here now it made me wonder though what do agents um actually have to do in order to get onto spotlight what's this is this agents yeah this is the agents okay I was just making sure that I haven't got the casting directors by mistake so how do I become a Spotlight registered agent? In order to become a registered agent, you will need to fill out an initial Spotlight agent registration. Once you have provided some basic details, a dedicated account manager will get in touch to complete the registration process. Each registration application is assessed individually. Key things we look for include information about you and your business, how long you have been established, number of staff and, members, uh, and membership of the relevant professional organizations. Now, obviously, they're talking about the, the organizations that I, I'm guessing they're talking about. Excuse me. Let me rephrase that. I'm guessing that they are talking about the organizations that are listed on on the equity website however it's a bit i i it i wonder is is this is this something does this mean that there's other organizations i wouldn't know but but it, this would also potentially suggest to me that you, it's not always necessary to be listed on one of these I mean I don't know is it is it a requirement I, let me ask that let me ask that as a question is that is it a requirement for agents now to be listed on one of these uh particular uh establishments in order to complete the registration for the spotlight um, and it also says, it goes on to say, we also review information about your client's agent and agency structure, number of clients, client specialization, commission rates and how you select your clients. And once the questionnaire has been completed, uh, your registration approved, you'll be sent an email so you can set up an account with a username and password. So I think, do you know, there's there's one thing that I think Spotlight do need to do with their agency listing so let's uh let's just click on a random one. Oh, i know these guys i know these guys are on the pma yeah oh they do do it so they've listed professional Ma managers association okay i knew they were on the pma though but let's see if there's any others uh Remember, this is not to um, undermine these people. Um, let's just have a quick look. Uh, this is voiceover. There's, I'm sure there's different listings for voiceover. Let's just see. Okay, yeah, good. So we're seeing the list. So maybe it has become a requirement Great. If it is a requirement, fantastic. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, so who, who knows? Who knows? So, yeah. Is it a, is it a 100% a requirement for agents to to have this registration. I think it should be, to be honest with you. And I also think that there should be some kind of guild 
that they should be members of before they can apply to things like Spotlight and start representing people. Because if actors have to jump through loops and casting directors, because there's a casting director skill, I believe, have to uh, jump through hoops, then why can't agents? Because we have to have our qualifications. So why can't we, you know, why, why can't they, in addition to having their business, be on the, that their association websites, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, like almost like their union kind of thing or whatever, and have a guild at the same time. Because we have to have a union. We have like, uh, I think we have Bet2, which is the other union, and we have Equity. And then, of course, we have uh, SAG if we were doing something abroad in America. Now, yeah, so I wonder, I think it should be a requirement. requirement. Every single agent should be on this list. I think the, 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 the testing needs to be stricter. I think so. So now let's get into why everything is is happening. So fake tapes, lies and late payments. UK talent agent Archie Purnell accused of being a rogue trader. Please remember the, these are allegations. I'm not trying to undermine anyone. It's what we can learn from it. Exclusive, a British talent agent who has worked with soap stars including Emma Rigby and Helen Flanagan has been accused of professional misconduct by six former clients. Now, I find it so interesting that this has just like exploded like the way that it did. The, the fact that it's made headlines. Arch Purnell, founder of Manchester-based Body Talent, has supplied actors to major productions for Netflix, the BBC and ITV, but is facing claims he misled clients in bid to bolster his standing in the industry. Deadline has uncovered a series of allegations. Remember, they are just allegations about the agent. And I, I hate to think um, how the actors are feeling as well. I, I sympathise with them. I know. I understand. Uh, including that he has sent actors a legitimate brief for self tape auditions, broke regulations on payment deadlines, and failed to observe industry best practice in contracts. Bodhi is currently at risk of being struck off by a UK company's house register for filing its accounts late. Now, UK agents are regulated by the state-backed employment agency standard that's the uh, incorporate that is the EAS. Now, I will get to that much later, but complaints about entertainment agencies are rare because actors worry, and this is so important, right? Okay, because actors worry, and I told you this at the beginning that I'm taking a risk that it could damage their own careers. You hear that? Do you hear that? I didn't care. I just went straight to the yeah. That's when it happened to me because I was just I was so mad. Um, most major agencies, such as UTA and Curtis Brown, are members of the PMA, which has a code of practice. And Body Body is not a member of the PMA. I am hoping I am pronouncing this correctly. Pronell said he was absolutely stunned by the totally incorrect allegations, claiming that they were part of a witch hunt being pursued by actors and a rival agent. He did not respond to any specific allegations against him and deleted his social media accounts soon after being contacted for comment. A former child actor, Pernell, founded... Bodhi Talent in 2021 after working at other agencies in north of England. He is described as charismatic and persuasive individual who built a client roster that includes Rigby and Tommy Cannon, one half of the much-loved UK comedy double act Cannon and Ball. Cannon did not respond to a request for comment for this article. Rigby, who has starred in BBC One's Death in Paradise and Sky's Bulletproof, recently returned as series regular Hannah Ashworth on Channel 4 Soap. Hollyoaks Bodie posted about her return to Hollyoaks on Twitter, now X, despite not being involved in the casting deal, according to the production source. Rigby declined to comment. And the reason why they're declining is because 
this could be bad for their reputation, in particular because they are known. Um, and I'm talking about uh, Cannon and uh, Rigby there. Bodie worked with Flanagan, who starred in Coronation Street and I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out Here. Of here, between 2021 and 2022, Flanagan declined to comment for this story. Lesser known actors on Bodie Books have secured below the lines in series, including Netflix's Red Rose and Disney's Wedding Season. Fake Tapes Invitations, Pernell, who also goes by Jamie Fisher and AP James. Now, um, we uh we uh do use stage names even agents use stage names as well um he once said on an industry podcast that he considers his relationships with clients to be a sexless ma marriage in which an enduring partnership is forged through communication and honesty and just highlight that word honesty but former clients told deadline that they quipped Bodie, after becoming troubled by their dealings with Purnell, two of the actors said that they could not trust the agent amid suspicion about the legitimacy of self-tape audition invitations they were receiving while others complained about issues securing payment for acting jobs. Ex-clients accused Bodie of copying and pasting the details of genuine self-tape briefs from casting directors and supplying them to actors who had not been called to audition for the specific role. Now, I've heard of this sort of thing happening before, just to be clear. Right, let's carry on. And I'm not saying that he's done this, just to be clear as well. Uh, those affected suspected that Bodhi had no intention of passing on the filmed auditions to a casting director. The practice of actors filming their own auditions and submitting them digitally became commonplace during the pandemic. I hate self-tapes, just to be clear. Uh, advocates say they have made the industry more accessible, but critics have warned that they are open to exploitation. Now, we'll get to talking about self-tapes in a minute because I have some very strong opinions on self-tapes. Purnell was accused of sending actors fake self-tape invitations to keep clients happy and burnish Bodhi's reputation for providing people with a steady stream of leads. Some spoke of auditions appearing in their inbox soon as after they had bemoaned at uh, an, a lack of new work. Now, I'm going to say something here, actors, please you know, auditions are like buses. They come in droves and they are, sometimes you don't have any for months on end and then suddenly it goes boom, 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 boom. I have a little technique. If I'm just going to show you, I have this book and it's called a You Can Do It Notebook and I write down in here every single audition that I attend, how I feel I did, and if I get a recall, and if I don't, and once I've actually written it down and got it off my mind, I don't think about it anymore. And I'm not worried if I don't have a, an audition for months, months on end, and I know actors get itchy feet, but Agents don't like it when you moan. <laughs> I hate to say it, but the fact that this has possibly resulted in um, fake auditions, that's that's not acceptable. You can ask, uh, so I don't know if actors know this, you can ask your agent to send you the list of submissions that they send you for um, so that you know exactly what you're up for, potentially. If you think there's a lack of audition, then you also need to have a look at the reason why there may be a lack of audition. Is it something to do with your headshots? Is it something to do with your material? Is it something to do with... Um, 
your location there's all sorts of things and then it just could be nothing it just could be that it's a little bit dry and maybe that there are some more other suitable people for the role you know and when you do actually get given an audition the the positive behind that is that somebody wants to see you and you just take it you grab it by the balls as my old, old teacher used to say and you just you just do it because you are taking the opportunity to do something that you love but yeah um so I've never once moaned to my agent about the lack of auditions because they they do come but they're like blooming buses so uh, just carrying on with the article now in one example review by deadline an actress was sent a self-tape audition invitation for a role 12 after 12 hours sorry 12 hours after the submission deadline had passed now that's rare another ex-client client alleged that they were sent a self-tape brief for a role nearby double their age and only discovered when told by a rival agency um and then Layla Shirley, an actress who has appeared in Peaky Blinders, who was another suspected that Bodhi had sent her a fake self-tape request. Shirley had said she had left Bodhi because she felt neglected by the agency, and she alleged that Pernell rarely replied to her calls or her emails. Interesting. That's very interesting because um, when I was at my last agent, the agent before, the one that duped me, if I was to contact the head agent, the replies weren't as consistent as it was if it was just my main agent, because um, there was the head agent and then my main agent. My main agent was legit, the head agent, she, well, you'll get to know a little bit later. Um, now, we all know the red flags um, for agents being asked to join, uh, being asked to pay to join the books, no business premises, but it may not be always be that obvious. She said, Bodhi presented such a legitimate and respectable front that they managed to mislead many. Purnell was described as a liar by those who have encountered him. For example, on his now deleted LinkedIn profile, he claimed he went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in 2014, but the prestigious London Drama School told Deadline it had no record of Purnell or Jamie Fisher. And I'm guessing Jamie Fisher might be his... I don't know. I'm not going to assume. Partic uh, participating in a higher education course, Melanie Ash, former actress who had a recurring role in Emmerdale, was represented by Purnell before he launched Bodhi and has known him for around a decade. And she said, people are scared of him because he gives the appearance of being pally with powerful people, including top casting directors. People should not believe the hype. Another former client who wished to remain anonymous alleged that Pernell lied about them securing a role in an advert. The ex-client said they only realised that they got had not got the job when they saw the ad on television and it was nearly identical to the storyboard that they had been sent for the audition. I was relying on that money, the person said. When he told me I was crying with happiness because of the fee, it makes me feel sick. He heard me cry and said, you've done it. You're a star. I knew you would get it. And you're getting all that money. And then it goes on to talk about late payments. Uh, where another complaint with Bodhi appearing to have breached UK agency regulations by not remunerating clients within 10 days of being paid by a broadcaster or streamer. Okay, so what happens is when you've actually completed... Uh, a filming production of something the um the agent submits an invoice to the production company and the production company um sends it to the agent and then the agent deducts their commission and Oh, they also get a, something called a remission slip and the agency deducts from the uh, commission and then they're supposed to um pay you within a certain amount of time which is generally specified in the contract as to what that actually might be and you'll get that with the commission deduction and the VAT deduction if they pay VAT which of course most agencies do 
Bodhi contracts also state that at shall receive all money is due within 10 days of hitting the agency's bank account. In the last three cases reviewed by deadline actors alleged that Bodhi failed to pay them pro promptly. Purnell would blame the production for paying late. Oh, that sounds familiar. That sounds very familiar. Oh, yeah. I've heard that one before. Even though the BBC and ITV usually release payments for actors within two weeks of their engagement, in one of the cases, actors union equity were forced to step in to resolve the situation after Bodhi uh, retained around half of a client's fee. Bodhi did eventually pay, but the weeks, uh, but weeks after the ten-day deadline enshrined of the co uh, conduct of employment agencies and employment business regulations. Now, so he went and paid. Wow. But, oh man, gosh, it was so much more of a bigger loophole for me in that sense. I had to fight my battle really hard, like 10 times harder. And I'm not saying that to undermine, it's just, it's so sad. Here, you know, the obviously these are claims, they're allegations. I'm not saying they're true and I'm not saying they're false. And I'm not saying that Archie is guilty and I'm not saying that he is innocent, but it's just so sickening when you hear things like this. And having experienced it myself, sometimes you just don't know if you actually say the right thing, do you? I mean, you've got to think what this kind of treatment does to someone's mental health. It's really sick. One ex-client said actors live from paycheck to paycheck, meaning that late payments can create difficulty with the cost of living. Now, most actors have a, what they call, they call it a muggle job now. And they call it a muggle job. And um, they work in between and they do their muggle job in between. And some, and uh you know, and then they just wait for the next audition to come around. And of course, you know, some actors also have, uh, you know, they, they do actually go from job to job, you know. And I, I've had contracts that have lasted for weeks. And it's so important to for, for those to get paid on time. So one next client said actors live from paycheck to check paycheck. I've read that bit. Uh, meaning that late payments can create difficulty with cost of living, especially with today's money. Uh, I had a conversation with Archie asking when the money was coming in because I was about to go beyond my overdraft limit. Another said, it was like an episode of BBC Road, Rogue Traders in which you're the victim. Bodhi failed to observe industry standards by attempting to hold clients to a notice period after um, they decided to leave the agency. That's interesting phrasing because hold clients to a notice period after they decided to leave the agency. Hmm. The PMA, uh, the membership for Body for UK uh, agents states the agency should not seek to enforce any time restriction in relation to a client's notice of termination of representation. A, comment, uh, a copy of Bodhi contract attained by deadline states that a client may terminate this agreement by giving one month's notice in writing unless otherwise agreed. Ah, okay, I understand what it was saying before now. So on one occasion, when attempting to enforce a client's notice period, Pernell threatened to report uh, arrival to agents of the PMA for signing the actor. That's ridiculous. Bodhi is not a member of the PMA, and it is unclear if Purnell understood that by reporting his rival, he would have revealed that his own contracts fell below PMA standards. Uh, UK agents are not allowed to charge clients a fee for representation. Um, We'll get into that. But Bodhi has been accused of attempting to collect money from clients by other means. When signing on Bodhi, new clients were sent an email that saying that they must attend, paid for workshops with casting directors organized by Bodhi's sister company, Access Workshops. Bodhi has been charging actors as much as £60 to attend these workshops. I've attended a 
casting director workshops. There's no way a casting director charges that much. That's a lot. At least I don't recall a casting director charging that much. I mean, I might be wrong, but but even the elite casting directors, those who are considered elite, I don't think I've ever seen their workshops for that much. 30, maybe 40. Um, even their CV surgeries aren't that much. Uh, according to documents seen by Deadline, UK casting director guidelines state that fees for workshops should not be excessively high. And yes, of course, that's because actors, we don't work all the time. Um, one casting director told Deadline that 60 was a ludicrous free fee, while another said they would not participate in workshops if an agent was profiting. And Equity Source said the appearance of mandatory workshop fees was against the spirit of the law, which enforced by the Employment Agency Standards Inspectorate. Some former clients did make clear, however, that they were not penalised for failing to show up to workshops. Um, and then it's just go, it goes on about um, Companies House and Archie not being uh, responsive to uh, comments. So... Yes. So uh, obviously, there's there's a lot going on here. Now, UK agents are not allowed to charge clients a fee for representation. It's not a case of not allowed. It's just it's not it's not common practice. It's it's an industry standard to not do it but there's the the government have weird 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 um wordings on what you can charge for and what you can't with regards to um working with a client we'll get to those now uh hey, hey. self tapes now here's the thing okay so self tapes are incredibly incredibly hard work so you get sent a breakdown by your agent and the it's it's really it's you've got to look at it you've got to learn it and there's all all these like equity uh things that have to be followed by the person um not not necessarily by the actor but by the person who's creating the casting call and there's a certain amount of time that you have to learn everything and but let's get into self tapes okay so my misgivings um around self tapes is that you lose the personal connection so an audition is an audition for the actor the performer but it's also an audition for the production company the director as well because it once you get in that room you can establish your rapport you can see what people are like you can give an initial opinion on that and you can go right I think I know what I'm letting myself in for and self-tapes lose that they lose that now uh, I really want to do away with self-tapes but um, someone pointed out to me when I said that the other day and I because I, I didn't think about it and it's unusual for me not to think about it, and I think it was just because I was angry hearing what I was hearing, is that obviously it takes away the accessibility for um, disabled people. Now, of course, I don't want to remove that accessibility for, for disabled people. That should remain in place in that sense. But there's got to be something to make them better um, and to reduce the amount of self-taping that we are doing. Like, I don't know. But I'll talk about it a bit later. But I want to show you very briefly some of uh, my things. Okay, so I'm going to show you the introduction. Hello, my name is Rachel Link. I'm 35 years old. My agent is U Management. And I like baking cakes and cookies.
Okay, so if you can't see the screen and you're listening to the podcast right now, it's me and I'm turning around showing my um, what I look like on the camera. Okay, so that is a standard introduction that you would make. Uh, that's from a self-tape that was uh, a long time ago now. How long ago was it? Two years ago. Um, that's already been by and by right now um and then so you have to do all of your introductions that is a standard thing and you would do it in the audition room and you you heard me mention i like baking and cookies that's me trying to give some kind of rapport to the the people who are auditioning me that i can't see and that i know next to nothing about now that was a legitimate uh, self tape that I I sent in to um, my agent at the time, and I actually got feedback for that self tape, which rarely happens, but it's nice when it does. Um, and then this one, I uploaded this one just as a, a normal video as well because I, I quite liked it. But this one was also a an audition piece, um, and it was just standard. I do think it is their husband's fault. If wives do fall, say they slept in their duties, or pour our treasures into foreign lands, or else break up in peevish jealousy. Right, okay, so in this particular audition that you see on the screen, um, as you can see, I'm wearing a colour that makes me pop, and it's a very basic neutral colour, and I have an extremely well-lit background, and that's coming from something called softbox lighting now i can use a ring light but now ring lights unfortunately i don't like them because they create, create rings in your eyes and now as you can see also here i'm wearing some uh, a kind of makeup that i think would actually be good for amelia this is uh, taken from othello um but the amount of time it took in uh, it took me to set up the tripod set up my lighting system learn the script, get ready to do the audition, film it, edit it, send it in. It took a couple of days to do. And it's a long time. And this is why also if you are being sent fake audition tapes, this is a problem. You know, this is a problem. You spend all that time putting something like this together. It can take a couple of days. It can take a week some actors do multiple takes i've saw one actor that had a self tape out and he had done about 20 odd takes and it was a lot you know actors put themselves through so much stress i filmed the amelia audition i did one rehearsal take and then i filmed it twice and interesting enough this is the rehearsal take this is the take that my agent chose. When I can't choose, uh, when I can't decide on a take, I send it to my agent. I say which one, and she'll go that one. Great. That's teamwork. And then here's another example. Now this was for uh, Do or Die. So this was a duologue, and I. This was when it was lockdown. And this is quite a common thing that has to happen. You have to have a duologue. Now, normally when you're in an audition room, that it is the casting director who does the duologue with you or the casting director's um, assistant. And they, they will do it with you. Now, then generally they have some sort of acting experience. So it's very, um, it's very easy to, to bounce off of them. But... When you're doing a self-tape, unless you, you get another actor, you you can actually luck out on someone's experience. And I was quite lucky here um, because the person that I was reading with, even though he hasn't acted for a long time, he does have some acting experience. Ooh, excuse me. So this is me on screen and I'm doing a duologue. Well... Who best describes those types of affairs than Poe? So, when you spoke of how you broke that man's 
trachea and he felt the saliva gathering in his airways and the lack of oxygen dimmed his eyes into unconsciousness. Shh, must you be so averse in public? I barely know you to trust you in trying to oust me. Mm -hmm. What, does your brother know that you strangled that man? Does your school know that you buried someone? I mean, more than you being very explicit allowed to people that may hear. So the thing about that tape with my wonderful face on the screen, poor, uh, pulling a face like a wet fish, um, is um, I had to pull my friend up on my Mac. And I am, I've got my Mac because I needed my phone to film because I, I, my other camera wasn't working at the time and I needed, I needed my Mac. And it, my Mac was propped up so unnecessarily Hi, and it's just the thing, and I'm filming in a sm in an incredibly small space, and it's the things that we had to go through in order to create these self tapes. This one took about a week to get right because I also had to wait for him to become available as well. It took about a week to get right. So, you know, we put in so much time and so much effort, and to have potentially fake tapes sent to you. No wonder we get mad. No wonder we end up crying. No wonder our mental health suffers because actors, you know, we, we go, oh my gosh, I'm not working. Oh my gosh, I'm not performing. It drives us, it, it, it's, it's like, I don't even know how to explain it. It, it just drives us potty. Um, so yeah, I have misgivings around the tapes because they take away certain aspects that you would actually get in an audition room. And really, I want those aspects to come back. And hearing that these tapes that are allegedly uh, fake tapes, so to speak, being sent out, um, it, first of all, it breaks my heart. And second of all, am I going to ever trust a self-tape again after hearing this? which is why we need to do something about them. We need to reduce them. We can't just, it, whilst it's great for weeding out and like saying, no, 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 no. Okay, recall, 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 recall. I get it. It's, it's just something that needs to be uh, reduced. The amount that we, we need to do would be needs to be reduced. Because what you're interesting, you want to know something interesting is I've submitted loads of tapes over the years. And I've only ever gotten one job from a self-tape and one piece of feedback from the self-tape. Now, I didn't let that drive me in, insane. I didn't let it get to me. But I've had much better results being in, in the audition room. So I have serious misgivings around around these tapes uh, that have been sent out. And it's like, do I really want to actually now do self-tapes anymore? Because they could potentially be fake. Now, I'm not saying that the current agent that I'm with is going to send me fake tapes. I'm not saying that. But... You know, I, I could I could leave that agency and walk straight into another agency that is a scam and not realize it, even though I am good at doing my due diligence since I got duped and and have I have fake self tapes sent to me. I mean, I've been I've been lucky. And this is so incredibly sad now. I've been lucky that every single self-tape that has been sent to me, even through my agency that had duped me, have all been genuine. I think we need to do something about them for sure. Obviously, without removing the accessibility. Now, of course... Bodhi Talent, a UK agent accused of scamming parents for cash by promising a kids a shot at fame. Now, um, Bodhi Talent has been accused of exploiting the acting dreams of children by charging their parents potentially unlawful representation fees worth £100. A deadline investigation revealed last week how Manchester-based Bodhi had 
am I saying it right? Bodhi or Body, I never know, had uh, been accused of sending clients fake invitations for self tape auditions and breaking regulations by withholding paychecks from actors. And, um, and then it goes on to talk about the clients that quit the agency. I'll just skip past that because we've already done that. Um, now Deadline can reveal that a group of parents are on the warpath after claiming they had been scammed by the sister agency, Luna Kids Casting, which was set up to represent children and claims to have worked with the likes of Nickelodeon and the BBC. Some parents have reported the agency to the regular regulator the employment agency standards inspectorate which said it was prepared to investigate luna's compliance by the employment agencies act others also um said they are also exploring legal action now it just goes on to say that he's not responded to any of the allegations um and uh, it says that Deadline has been privy to a WhatsApp group in which more than a dozen parents have been left shell-shocked by their experience with Luna. The individuals who uh, the individuals were charged up to five hundred pounds, really, in fees to access acting roles for their children. But several complains that jobs never materialized now the agency staged at least three open audition days as part of recruitment drive and parents attended these auditions Ad estimated that around 20 children participated in at least one of the sessions and archie led the session and was very charismatic and spent a lot of time getting the kids excited about the industry building up their hopes i uh oh, this is a parent saying this um i particularly remember him talking about a lot of money, uh, a lot about the money they'll get. We called one parent who wished to remain anonymous. Those who were successful were sent an offer letter and contract detailing the cost of signing with headshots being the biggest fee. Um, okay, headshots, uh, you can... Uh, an agent can actually uh, charge for headshots, um, I believe. So that's from what that's from my research. I will get to that in a minute. Uh, parents were asked to enclose up to one hundred and eighty pounds in cash. Never pay in cash. Um, and the reason why you don't pay in cash is because. If you pay something like that in cash, particularly at that amount, that can lead, that could be considered cash under the table. It can lead to tax dodging and can, only, uh, can also lead to inaccurate accounts. Um, so they had to hand it to a receptionist on the day of the child's photo shoot at the Access Studios. Um UK law do allow, oh, it says it here anyway, UK law do allow agents to charge for photographs, but the cost has to be comparable to the price of taking headshots. And reps should not make an agency, uh, should not make a profit from this activity, according to a source who is an expert agency in regulations. I tell you something, actors and child actors, if you want a good budget, John Clark provides a, a good budget and he does a great 2.0 headshot and he does he does Pauline, Pauline Quirk's Academy children's photographs as well I do know uh, John Clark I'll, I'll plug him plug him in a, in in the description um it was 250 last time I, I checked anyway um I haven't got that up here because obviously I was not expecting to talk about John Clark but there you go um he was my original headshot photographer and he, he's done some really, really nice snaps. Um, carrying on. Uh, so, Anthony Junior, the actor who claimed he is owed money by Bodhi, in, said in a video on X that he also works as a photographer, did four lunar photo shots as a favour to Pernell. In the X video, Anthony Junior... Um, estimated that Pernell pocketed 10,000 from these shoots alone. Jesus. Which could mean around 55 children process uh, 
were processed as lunar clients in this period. That is 55 children. That's also a lot of clients. That's also a lot of children. Um, and then th there's uh, there's Luke Anthony. Go and hit him up. Go and give him a follow. Uh, that's everyone for the support. In thanks everyone he's meant to say for the uh, support in regard to these crooks. I'm so sorry to all affected, and I am too. It's very sad to hear this. And in this hashtag Bodhi Talent hash hashtag Archie Parnell, Jamie Fisher, Luna Kids casting, and um, it's got the it's got the tweets there. Um, so it carry it carries on going to uh, on to talking about the fees. Now, here's the thing. Obviously, I've said it's not standard practice um, for agents to charge a sign up fee, uh, but it's not against the law in entertainment with paying to have your representation so just click on to spotlight so we we pay for spotlight cv now equity has decided that it wants to um perhaps uh get rid of the 183 pounds 60. now on a standard job website you you know where you're just looking for a regular nine to five you don't pay because the the idea behind it is that you go in and uh, into these websites you set up your cv you apply for x y and z x y and z and then you um and then you get a full-time part-time job and you're not looking for anything else that's the theory but of course with acting it kind of doesn't it, it really doesn't work like that it doesn't work like that at all um because theoretically you're always looking for work even if you're like in a soap in a long paid acting job technically you're always looking for work so you you have to keep the cv updated you have to um update your headshots you have to update everything and everything ends up costing so much money now whether or not this cost can be done away with i don't know it could do with being reduced but you know, here or there, it's what I'm saying is it's not whilst it's not common practice, not against the law. Let's have a look. So I just wanna I just wanna read this. Okay, this is not me like defending any rogue agency here, just to be clear. But this is from the government website. This is charge fees as an entertainment and modeling agency. Now there was something that was uh in that article, I didn't read it, but it talks about a 30 day period. Wait, let's see if I can quickly find it. Uh, let me see. I should have, I should have read it really. Uh, 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 uh. Luna uh, wants to set up profiles for 120 pounds uh, for the children's profiles. Uh, that's it. At no point. So it, it's in the article, it talks about a 30 days cooling off a, pe a period where um, they are entitled to a full refund of um, setting up the, the profile and, and all of that jazz pizzazz, which is interesting because this, if that is true, this, this actually go, would suggest that, uh, that they took payment before the specified time here. So let me just uh, read this to you. You understand what I mean. Uh, fees for performers and workers. You can't charge or deduct money from an entertainment worker or performer's earnings until they agree to your terms and conditions. Promotional fees for performers and entertainment workers, not models. You can only charge upfront fees for listing the for performers uh, for listing the worker of the performer's details in promotional publications or on websites to help them find work. Uh, promotional publication includes listing information, publications or on websites and photographs or audio or video recordings. You must give the worker or performer a chance to see any copies. That's standard, you have to. Other fees or commission for finding work normally come out of the worker or performer's earnings from the employment fund that you found, which is what I've already said. Um, and then fees for promoting performers. You can only charge fees 30 days 
after the contract if there is a fee for promoting a performer, which is interesting because this article suggests would suggest potentially with the 30 days cooling off per, uh, period uh, where they are entitled to a full refund if they uh, uh, withdraw from the agencies within the 30 days, that would suggest that they've already made the charge before the end of, of 30 days. Um, interesting. Uh, so you need to show the performer any promotional photographs, audio or, foot uh, or video footage before it's published. Then they have uh, seven days to object to anything being used. You can't charge the performer until seven days is over or you have dealt with any reasonable requirement from the performer, whichever is later. And, of course, that goes against um, what's being alleged in this article where they're talking about headshots they they present 180 pounds in cash in an envelope on the day of the photo shoot that's interesting and yet it says here you can't charge the performer until seven days is over or you've dealt with any reasonable requirement whichever is later and you can charge fees for actors background artists dancers extras musicians singers and other performers Uh, if there is a fee for promoting a worker, you can only charge this after a seven-day contract. Yeah, um, this covers these types of workers. So it goes, then those are different types of workers here. So the actors. So, yeah. Um, so that's interesting. So what is saying in the deadline article conflicts with what's on the government's website. Interesting. That's interesting. I learned something new. Who the funk, huh? <laughs> um now parents of course um uh they can uh they they can be um targets because uh particularly parents who have never worked in the industry our industry before they can be targets because they they don't know anything about it but show this video to people so that maybe that they can learn uh something about it and and um you know maybe you know some people will be like i'm going to set up an agency i'm going to do it parents coaching money comes in front of their eyes and it's like well because they if these parents don't know how the entertainment industry work i can do this i can do this i can do this i can do this and i can do this wrong that can't happen you have to comply with what's on the government website that's what they recommend so your best bet is to comply with it. Now, I want to get into um, uh, my own issue before I talk about the uh, EAS with you. So I I originally uh, thought when I saw this, I, I connected uh, Bodhi with 2021 and I connected the wrong year and I thought it was the same agent that I looked at and orig uh, originally but I realized I, I got them a year out but but I do stand by what I said when I said in my tweet that I found that um I, I just found that they didn't seem you know legit there was something off about them I looked at a couple of where agents websites uh prior to um join in the agency that duped me and there was one of them and it just didn't feel right so I just went to the agent and walked into the same situation that some of these actors are now so if you haven't learned anything from what I've told you in this video or you're not taking anything away then take this away at least so i um i got an uh, i got an audition uh, a legitimate audition it was a real audition thank goodness um i attended this audition this audition was in london um 
I did it. I got shortlisted and I got the job. I went to London. I filmed the uh, commercial. And this was around, would have been around, oh my gosh, uh, September 2019, which is why the, the my dates were slightly off. Um, but it's okay, it's fine. It that's that's by the by. And um I filmed it and I was went away. I was really pleased with what I did and I waited for my wages and the wages would have been the studio fee and I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited a really really long time an insanely <laughs> long time and it got to the point where my main agent asked me have you been paid and of course that sent some alarm bells ringing because I was like, oh, if she's asking me that, then there's a problem. And this this was occurring sort of, I don't know, it was around November, December time. So it it, it was clear there was something wrong. So um, she decided she was going to follow it up with with him, the agent, main head, head, head agent, excuse me. And I've been talking a long time now. And... Um, so let's call with that and I sent some emails and and I, I didn't hear anything for a long time and it's like it's making me anxious to just thinking about it it's I hate thinking about it but it's so important you have to you have to take from it um and I was I was like <laughs> um so yeah, uh, so all these emails were uh, going backwards and forwards, trying to uh, find out what was happening with the, um, the the studio fee, and he was saying that he hadn't received it. Yada yada yada, all of that jazz pizzazz, and um, eventually it got to the point where I was really suspicious. And several sort of several things sort of happened around the the same around the same sort of time. Um, so my main agent, she uh, she managed to somehow get hold of the remissions slip, and I also had turfed out the um, contract with the production company that I had to have a look at because uh, on the on the contracts um they they tend to list the agent that's associated with the actor and i had a look at the at the agency that was um the uh, uh agency of the other actress and so i i bit the bullet and i took a risk and I, I contacted this particular agent. Now, this agent was not angry with me. Just to be clear, uh, she wasn't angry with me that I contacted her. And in actual fact, she was very kind. And she and she told me that um, she had received the studio fee, along with the costume fitting fee as well, actually. And... She had um, the agency had been paid, their commission had been taken, and the money had been sent on to their client. And and um, I was like, okay, thank you. And that was also around the same same sort of time that I um, I got the uh, remission slip from my main agent, and it all, it all confirmed and it all tied in. And I ended up having to contact the Actors Union Equity, Martin Kenny. Uh, my main agent, I didn't say this in my tweet, but my main agent also contacted him um, as well. Um, it's that that big of a concern that I had to work to with my main agent and 
there were other clients who also had a problem as well and um and so i contacted equity and excuse me that's my phone going off and equity um advised me to uh essentially go to the production company and so i'm trying to leave um uh uh, the production company's name out of it and um and essentially block it block the buyout which, so if you don't know what a buyout is buyout is like when they decide that they're going to go ahead and use a commercial um use the commercial and uh, you get an x amount lump sum so they said block it and um, make sure that it gets paid directly to you and then we can do the commission via equity because I was going to be honest, I was still going to pay the commission. I wasn't going to dupe anyone. Now, if I had it my way, I would have paid the commission directly to the main agent because it, uh, to my main, main agent, because she got me into that room. But, you know, I can't do that. So, because that's not what the contract states. And I wish it had, but yeah. So I, um, I was like, okay, cool. Um, but I was also a little bit suspicious about um, the agent, the head agent. I was, I was slightly uh, worried that um, he was getting information on me, and I wasn't entirely sure. Now, this could be naivety. Even at my age, you can still get it. But I wasn't entirely sure how he was obtaining it. So when the buyout was coming through, I sent out a cryptic tweet. Now, this cryptic tweet was so well phrased that myself, my main agent, and the head agent would only know what it meant and um so what happened was uh i found out i'd been blocked by this agent and this is when i find out that you could actually read people's blocked tweets um so if you block someone on twitter you can actually then go into your blocked list and you can pull up the person that you've blocked and you can access their tweets. So he basically took advantage of a flawed system on X, formerly Twitter at the time, and used it against me as ammunition. And once he'd read that cryptic tweet, he then went and contacted the production company and then it resulted in me in getting an email from the casting director now i hadn't really been um talking about this with uh, anyone because it was going on it was all legal stuff and the casting director questioned me obviously and so i ended up explaining to her i was like look this is what's happened um this, that, and the other, explained it all. Uh, okay, she's like, okay, no problem. And she uh, contacted uh, the production company. And um, it, it basically, nothing really came from it from uh, from there. I didn't hear anything else um, from her with regards to what was going on. And um, so the production company sent me up as a sole trader, and they, on, on the site and then they um transferred the money to me and then i immediately transferred the commission to equity um and then equity uh dealt with that from there but i want to just go back to the studio fee with equity so you know i've just talked about the buyout and all of that um but i've just realized i forgot to finish talking about the studio fee the studio fee so um equity got involved with the studio fee and he'd spent like 
weeks and weeks and weeks telling me that he's not received it. It was a late payment from the production company, this, that, and the other, yada, yada, yada. And he, <clears throat> and he um, suddenly had the money when Equity contacted him. So I was told by Equity that he's going to pay by X date. He didn't pay. And then so there was that uh, some back back and forth between them and whatever was going on. I was I was pretty much staying out of it. I was not having direct contact with him and I wouldn't do it. And it was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And um, I got fed up with waiting. And I ended up doing some research on how I could actually get my money because I was going to end up having to go to small claims court at the rate it was going. And I really didn't want to go to small claims court. I wanted my money. I wanted my studio fee. I didn't care about the commission. He could keep that, right? But I wanted my cash. And and I didn't know how to go about it. And I ended up having to research and I ended up going to uh, the um, government website in order to actually find out about it. And here we go. Let me show you. This is the EAS the Employment Agency Standards Inspectorate. So I contacted these guys and I asked, do performance agencies come under you? And guess what? They do. They do come under them. And to me, that was great news because if, you know, if I could avoid if I could avoid small claims court, then that's what I was gonna do. I was going to avoid them. So um they asked me what happened. I told them what happened, I gave them all the information that they needed to know. Obviously, I'm not gonna read um what's on their website. You can go and have a look at it. And they got me my my studio fee within, I think it was. But I can't quite remember the time frame. I think it was about two weeks. And um, funny enough, the guy that I spoke to at the EAS actually knew who I was talking about because he'd had dealings with him already. So it's it says a lot. Um, so, you know, actors are, of course extremely afraid to speak and the reason why actors are extremely afraid to speak is because it's um this sort of thing can affect our careers now i'm speaking and i'm saying things and i'm doing things and i don't care because at the end of the day I, as i said i've released opinions on this channel that would make me lose any job any day anyway and i'm quite an opinionated person um, in many regards, I may not always be right, but you know that that's me. That's me. And um, but a lot of actors won't speak out. A lot of actors will prefer to name be you know nameless because it. <sighs> what it does is when you apply for an agency, it sets up this whole debacle of like. Are you trustworthy? If you've complained about an agent, what are you going to say about me? If you're saying this, what are you going to do? What could you do to me? Could you report me to the EAS? Could you get me in trouble with equity? Could you get me removed from Spotlight? I don't know. I don't want to work with you. I don't think you're the sort of person that we should be working with because you've, you've reported this agent. All of these questions go through our head. Like when I changed my agency, my main agent, she got a job at the agent that I was with for four and a half years. And she said, do you want to come? I was like, yeah, all right. So I went, stayed there four and a half years. One of the best agencies I've ever worked with. And I, I will never regret working 
with them. I'll just say that. Let's just put it like that. But the communication was so key. They they were so understanding of the issues that I had with surrounding my agent. They were they were so aware of it. And they took note. And I wasn't at fault because I told them my issue. And I was honest that I wasn't at fault for it. But other agents could potentially, you know, what we fear. And even in with like uh, things with like casting directors, if they hear that you've done X, Y, and Z, then that can also create issues for us. This is why actors are, are afraid to speak, or if they do want to speak, they remain nameless. I'm on the screen though, so you know, <laughs> but I might have a problem or two in the future. Now, what do uh, Spotlight need to do? I think Spotlight need to do more vigorous checks, that's for sure. I think we need an agent's guild. If we've got Spotlight CV and we have our actors union and um, casting directors have their guild, I think. I think we need an agency guild and I think the loop, uh, not the loopholes, but the holes that agents will need to jump through and will need to be far greater than um, what they are already, I think. Because actors do a lot, cast and directors do a lot, so music professionals do a lot. So they, I think they need to do more. I think they need to do more. Um, and, you know, that also, uh, like, I, and I, what can agencies do? Well, agencies, I think agencies should 100% be making sure that they are on the list that we, you know, I've discussed in this video. And what can equity do about self-tapes? Well, I think equity should try and make a rule where actors get back in the room because of potential fake tapes, potential scams, things that we actors accidentally walk into and we're innocent about it. We don't know that we're walking into it and we do it. I've done it. Other people have done it. It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. And I don't want to take away from people who are uh, disabled. So if, you know, so maybe self-tapes should stay around, but we need just need to reduce the amount that we do get ourselves back in the room i don't know there needs to be stronger rulings with regards and like maybe there could also be um some kind of like we've watched it system and we get a receipt from the casting director to say that they have it and and the actor sorry the actor gets that receipt but I don't know how you would go about that because a lot of actors are represented by an agent and the agent is the direct contact for the casting director to actors. So I don't know how you would go about it, but maybe some kind of receipt. I don't know though, it's, it's so tricky. But equity, if you've watched this, please consider it. Now, before I round up, um, I just want to have a look at these people, the 98% pod. Home of the real actor's life. So actor's life is just something that we all uh, put as a, a as a hashtag. Now, they've been quite active with um, talking about the industry, as they can see, as, as you can see, actor's life with anecdotes. Actors love anecdotes. Advice, interviews, dripping with brutal honesty. They have, um, both of them have been tweeting about, as you can see here, on February the 15th, a couple of days ago, uh, where I got the article from. This is where I got the article from. Um, 
and they're talking about Bodhi talent and they say there are parents who turned up uh, to a class last night not knowing anything. If you are in Manchester industry, please get the word out. This is criminal behavior. And um, here we go. They're talking about the police. Uh, fortunately, this is Scott Vickers. He says, I am personally aware of another large agency who are hopefully about to be exposed doing the fake tapes thing, having clients believe they have tape quests they don't. That's disgusting. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're talking, uh, they, they talk about everything in the industry, but they've been quite focused. There used to be a lady... Um, and I'm not going to drop her name um, just because she uh, she's sort of stepped back. But she used to be quite active and these two have taken over with um, with what she was doing. But she used to be quite active in calling out agents. I used to talk to her a fair bit, um, but she's taken a step back from it now. But, um, yeah, go and follow these these two. And if you have a problem, if you've had problems with agents... Um, contact them. You can also contact me as well, but I, th I feel like perhaps these two <laughs> might be better than me because I can be like incredibly harsh. Uh, not towards like you, but maybe um, I might drop a name or two <laughs> without thinking. I've, I've been very careful here. So all in all, um, you know, this whole entire debacle highlights a load of industry flaws that we actually do have and hopefully we can we can take this sick thing these allegations uh, of course they are just allegations and i you know i don't want to undermine anyone but we can take take it and we can learn from it and we can apply the knowledge and maybe hopefully places like equity spotlight um and drama schools will actually up their game in in protecting people you know the the drama schools university educating new actors in things like this this is so important and it lacks um actually you know forget the budgeting actually give proper audition lessons proper self-tape lessons proper proper way proper tools and methods to um suss out who is legit, who is not, and who to contact when something goes wrong. Because that was never given to me. I had to teach myself that. And that's sad. And that was the days before really rapid social media that we have now, 2009. Yeah, I had to teach myself. And that's sad. And maybe we do need to create an agent skilled. Maybe we do need stricter ruling. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to say. There's so many things that we need that need to be better in the industry. But I guess it's one obstacle at the time and hopefully we can all learn something from this. So let me know what you think. Chat about it, don't chat about it. Subscribe to my channel. I have linked absolutely everything except for one video um because that has to remain unlisted uh below and i will see you very soon oh, oh don't forget to join my discord server you can come over there i have a new one and subscribe to my podcast and of course go to my rumble um i will be hopefully uploading this to rumble uh so i've talked for long enough thank you very much for watching and I am going to go and I will see you next time. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you.